salatu ve selam ala Resulillah ellezî bu isa rahmet lil alemin sallallahu aleyhi ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmaîn emma ba'd فقال الله تعالى في القرآن الحكيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت وباركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبعد ونسأل الله تعالى أن يغفر لنا ذنوبنا ويكفر عنا سيئاتنا نسأله بعلم نافع ورزق واسع وعليه نتوكل وإليه المصير ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أيها الأخوة وحييكم بتحية الإسلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Peace and prayers of Allah be with you all uh, We begin as always by praising Allah who alone is worthy of all praise We praise him and we seek his forgiveness, guidance and his mercy We send peace and prayers on his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Allah and, his, uh, Allah and the angels also send uh, prayers on him or which means of course Allah's mercy on him and his acceptance of our prayers for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, I was just um, reflecting on um, some of um, my wife was reading a book, you'll know the book, written by the American journalist who accompanied Sheikh Akram. Oh, Khalifa. Yeah, Khalifa. she's written a book, hasn't she? Yeah, Ethiopian girl. Re yes, yes. Yeah. She was reading that. Okay. And one of the questions she asked Sheikh Akram was what special things about the Prophet um, that sticks in his mind that he likes. And I was thinking myself, and I thought about it before as well, there's certain things that really struck me. And of course, reading Sirah, despite whatever book you read it from, whether it's Qadi Yad Shifa, which isn't like a Sira narration for, for his life story. It's more about loving the Messenger of Allah, his virtues, you know, things like that. There's chapters like that. There's obviously some dangerous chapters like those who insult the Prophet Sallallahu from Qadi Ayyad, which I disagree with his conclusion on that, but you know, still. But other Sira writings, Ibn Isham, like Martin Ling's and that, despite the, 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 the question mark things in it, no doubt it brings you your love it increases for Rasulullah and I think that's why Qadi Ayyad called it his book on Rasulullah Shifa meaning a healing and it's famous that people who are ill especially in the Maghrib would read that book when they're ill <laughs> and I remember seriously not but this is before I came across uh, the Shifa of Qadi Ayyad when I was in my 20s when I first read Martin Ling's I remember reading it for the second or third time when I was ill in bed. Not because I felt there were some magical powers in it, by the way. No, just because it, what it does to my heart. Yeah, and I think it's for believers, it's always like that, isn't it, with Rasulullah But there are special things, and some of the things that really affect me, and the honesty and the truthfulness of Rasulullah is and I've mentioned it to you before, when I almost moved me in, and it wasn't the first time, of course, but that's one of the narrations, wakes up in the middle of the night, and she says, I'm searching in the dark for the message of Allah. And I remember her apartment's just at the threshold of the mosque. And she goes, I'm searching and fumbling in the dark. She seemed to reach out because she's just outside the apartment door in the masjid. And she says, SubhanAllah, I find his feet as erect because he's in sujood, crying to Allah and praying to him. And she goes, as loving words, she says that I, 
I thought you were somewhere else and you are in a different realm, subhanAllah. Because she thought he's gone to one of his other wives. She, 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 was getting, she, she feels so guilty. Yeah, I thought you were somewhere and you are somewhere else. Why would an imposter pray every night when nobody else is watching, praying to his Lord, for who he's calling others to? And any disbeliever, atheist, Christian Jew needs to think seriously about those things. Those who think he's an imposter. No way. No way. So that really touches me, stuff like that. Stuff like the Bedouin who comes from outside and the humility of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith, they mentioned it on Nasa'i, authentic hadith, and this Bedouin comes from far away from the tribe of, one of the tribes of Banu Bakr. And he co comes off his camel to the masjid, ties, Anas reports this, Anas ibn Malik, um, I think. And he ties his camel, and then he walks in with a loud voice and saying, Who's Muhammad? And I love this hadith because he's there, because he's saying the Prophet we were sat with us, was sat with the Sahaba. Who's Muhammad? Because he's not sat on a throne higher up. He hasn't got a big turban, bigger than the rest. He hasn't got robes on which are different from the rest. That's something we we need to seriously think about. You know, how about what we made religion into? This is a messenger of God, not like any scholar that came after him, not like any Sahabi. Messenger of God, it could have been distinct, you know, come away and say, oh yeah, there he is. No. Who is Muhammad? So they said, we have to say, it's that white man over there leaning, leaning back amongst his companions. <laughs> I love that. It's the white man over there. He <laughs> said, Rajul Abiyad. Because <laughs> he was fair complexion, wasn't he? Yeah. So let that remove away any racist comments that we have about white people. We have plenty of them as well. Because this man was white amongst the, uh, the, the, the Arabs. Uh, so that, that, his humility, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and what always sticks in my mind is his speech to the Ansar after Hunyay, the Battle of Hunyay, which we've had recently, haven't we? Which melts your heart away, doesn't it? How he is with them. And uh, how gently he is with them and how he puts their claims in that speech as truth. If they'd said, yeah, yeah, we took you in, we did this for you, he said, you would have been truthful. Oh, I'm sorry. It's beautiful, isn't it? It really is. Anyway, those are some of the things that uh, come to my mind about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when I think about him. And of course, the other thing is his maqam, his status on the day of judgment. Many believers don't realize it. Some even question. But in, in many ahadith, Bukhari, Muslim, others, about his status, compared to all prophets, all messengers, what his status is on the day of judgment. That's what always, always comes to, to my heart and mind when I think about the messenger of Allah. Oh, I always say, touching his skin with love means paradise. Touching his skin with harm or hatred means hellfire. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyway, coming back to the story, last time we were looking at after... Um, um, Ghazwatul Hunyain and Ta'if, we decided to take digress because something happened in the house of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we digressed and I said we would come to a situation where we'd cover all the marriages of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who he married, and a little bit to do with that. Most of it we covered last time, but also in that when we talked about Zainab bint Jash, you remember, we talked about his adopted son Zaid 
and the marriage of her to his adopted son. And a Quranic ayat linked with that last time, remember, which clarified that the adopted son was not to take the name of Zayd bin or Ibn Muhammad. That was changed. That's why he used to be called back to Zayd ibn, ibn Haritha. That we know him as till this day. So the Quran changed that was in Jahliya, uh, maybe perhaps all over the world. Uh, the idea that adopted son was like the real bloodline. Allah said, no, it isn't. And for that reason, as we discussed last time, he was made to marry yeah, Zainab bint Jahash after, after Zayd divorced her. And, and, and this is clear from last time, Zayd didn't divorce her because the Prophet doesn't want to marry him. <laughs> they were already having, so he kept on coming back, remember? It's mentioned in Santi Kadir. Uh, and also Quran mentions it as well that the Prophet was always saying hold on to her but in the end he divorced her so that's the story we mentioned last time to do with uh, something which Orientalists love to play on yeah, because there's some weak reports about that which try and uh, make out the Messenger of Allah as though he was uh, like inverted commas praying uh, not praying as in Salah, but praying on the wife of Zayd and that's why he divorced, etc. Which are false lies. Na'udhu billah min zalik. May Allah protect us from that. Um, so, uh, we did the marriages up to, as far as I remember, um, Safiya bin Khiyya ibn Akhtar. We mentioned that as well, because that was up after Khaybar. Yes, I remember mentioning it. Uh, mentioning that but we did miss out one which was after Uhud actually when I mentioned the marriage to uh, Hafsa Zainab bint Huzayma uh, Zainab bint Jahsh as well all of these are within a few months of each other and they're the year after Uhud including the marriage to Um Salama including the marriage to Um Salama and who was Um Salama? Sira. We covered the story before during the Hijra. And that's authentic in Hadith as well. The Hijra of Abu Salama, Um Salama, and their child and their son. Anybody remember the struggle they went through? Hijra obligation came. Abu Salama set out with his wife and child to go to migrate. So the family of Um Salama turned up and said, you're not taking our daughter. You remember? You're not taking our daughter. You can hop it. Off you go. The disbelievers from the family, of course, came out. Okay, so they stopped her going. So the husband, obligation, he decided that the message of Allah said, migrate. He's being separated from his wife and child. He went. So um, uh, Abu Salama went and then as a consequence, what happens? The family of Abu Salama, who were mushriks as well in Mecca still, what do they do? You know, Suhail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they come and take her son. Because they're claiming that, okay, oh, you stopped her going, and therefore we're going to take our son off you. How dare you do that? So the family of Abu Salama now, yeah, tit for tat, take the child of Um Salama, said, this is our son, how dare you, you've done this, so we'll take him. So the father's there in Medina, the mother's with, kept in her place, and the, the, the child is being kept by the other tribe. She says she spends nearly a year, she used to go out crying every night for her child and to be with her husband. This is their story. And in the end, uh, it was non-Muslims in the end, yeah? It was the non-Muslims in the end that convinced uh, the, 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 uh, the both family side, one to get her child back and the others to let her go to her husband. What's the matter with you lot? It wasn't Muslims, it was non-Muslims. Yeah? So she does eventually go there. But uh, Abu Salama also uh, dies from injuries similar to the, the husbands of others after Uhud. Yeah, so he's Shaheed. And she has children. The Prophet, like with the others, offers to marry her. 
Uh, Om Salama, an authentic hadith. Her name is Hind, by the way. Om Salama, because her child was, son was Salama. Her name is Hind. Uh, she says to the Messenger of Allah when he offers to marry her, uh, she says, um, I'm a very jealous woman. Okay. She's warning Rasulullah <laughs> And uh, she mentions two or three things. That's one of the ones I remember. And the other one, I have children to look after. You know. So the Prophet ﷺ said, as for your jealousy, I'll pray to Allah for it. <laughs> Meaning for you to be able to control it, I'll pray to Allah. And as for the your children, I'll take care of them. I'll take care of them. So she does end up marrying Rasulullah. Um Salama was one of the very clever, aside from Aisha. Yeah, she is very clever and the Prophet seeked her advice, especially on one occasion, which is already gone, when he was facing some difficulty from Sahaba. What was the occasion? Hudaybiyah. Yes, Hudaybiyah. Because of the treaty that was made, which was unfair, and they were in quite a strong situation now, the believers, but the Prophet made a peace uh, under the guidance of Allah. And even, if you know, that even Omar spoke rudely to Abu Bakr and then to the Messenger of Allah. Abu Bakr tried to reprimand him, and he said some very uh, uh, things which he regretted so much afterwards, yeah. and especially after uh, Surah Fath was revealed on the way back from Hudaybiyah, showing it as a clear victory. So anyway, Sahaba were troubled by this, and you know that uh, uh, Abu Jandal comes and he's in chains and he's imploring them to stop the persecution of his father who was there, Suhail, yeah, taken with him, and they said no. He, Prophet Sallallahu tried and he said, Allah will find you where to leave him behind. They can't cope with all that. So, uh, Prophet Sallallahu um, told the Sahaba, because they didn't manage to do the Umrah, that's what they came for, remember? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the Sahaba to sacrifice the animals nevertheless on the outskirts of Mecca and shave their heads. What's that an indication of? As though their umrah has been accepted, even though they were stopped from going in, isn't it? It's actually good news, isn't it? The Prophet has them saying, sacrifice your animals, shave your heads. But they didn't do it. They wouldn't do it. <laughs> he said it two or three times to them. And they were upset. So that's when he goes into the tent of Um Salama and says, What shall I do? And takes a counsel of Um Salama. And she says, Ya Rasulullah, they love you. You go quietly, don't say anything to anyone. Just silent. Just go and do. Yeah? Sacrifice your animal, shave your head. So that's what he does, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What happens? When they see now this, when they see that happening, no statement now, the Prophet is not saying anything else. One by one, they all start. Because they know that there's no way, perhaps, ulama say, perhaps some of them are thinking, mm, maybe he'll change his mind and we'll go in and do, do the tawaf around. No. And once he's done that, they know that's it. So they all start doing uh, that. So that was advice taken from Um Salama. Uh, okay. Now, Um Habiba bint Afi Sufyan. Uh, um Habiba's name was uh, Ramla. Ramla. And it's quite obvious that she's the daughter of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan ibn al Harith, the Abu Sufyan. Remember, I mentioned another Abu, Abu Sufyan ibn al Harith, who's from the family of Rasulullah as well. <coughs> this is the Abu Sufyan. And um, she was married, she was a believer. From early times, yeah, and she was married to Ubaidillah ibn Jahsh. It's ibn Jahsh again. There's Zainab bin, uh, bin uh, Jahsh, who was married to Zaid, and then they also married to Allah. So then there's uh, uh, Zainab uh, bin 
Khuzayma, who was married to Abdullah ibn Jahsh, you remember, I mentioned last time, who was, who was amongst the leader of the archers and was killed at martyred at Uhud. Yeah, so bin Jahsh comes in again, is <laughs> the name. And now his brother, the, the brother of the husband of Zainab bint Khuzayma, he was Abdullah, Ubaidullah was married to Ramla. Ramla, the daughter of Abu Sufyan, from time before. They both migrated with the early migration to Abyssinia. So they're both there all these years in the early parts of, uh, I remember the return of the people from Abyssinia, including Jafar, was just bef after Khaybar, yeah, just before Battle of Mu'ta, which we covered, okay? Are you talking about 6th, 7th year Hijrah? So Umm Habiba, how did she become the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Is that her husband dies. Yeah. In Sira writings, many places, you'll see, majority of them say, he turned to Christianity again. This is not authentic. This is not authentic. There is no Sahabi who embraced Islam, wasn't Munafiq, that ever changed back to Kufr or went to Christianity. Didn't happen. What did, they, what did uh, Heraclius ask Abu Sufyan? Have any of them embraced Islam and then renegated? What did Abu Sufyan say, even though it was Mushrik then? No. No. And this story is therefore false. You'll see it in the Sira writings. Not acceptable. Ubaidullah died a believer. But he died in Abyssinia. He never made it back, uh, made it to Medina. When he died, the Prophet heard about it. He knows who uh, Ramla is, whose daughter, but he offered to marry her. And he married her through an emissary <coughs> sent to Najashi. Yeah? Najashi uh, acted on behalf of Rasulullah and married him to Umm Habiba. So marriage took place then, but they came together after the return. Yeah? The marriage was a little bit earlier. And so Umm Habiba. Ramla joined the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Medina when Jafar came back. Okay, that's that uh, a, a story briefly. Maimuna, uh, after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, remember the part of the agreement was, and we've already covered it, was to return the following year to come and do the Umrah. Prophet was allowed to come and spend three days only. Okay, to come and do Umrah and then leave with his companions. Which is what they did. And we've covered that already. Yeah? That Umrah, as I said to you before, uh, some ulama call it Umrah to Qada because they say it's an Umrah to replace Umrah, which they won't manage to do at Hudaybiyah. Others call it a new Umrah. I'm with that group. Why? Because I believe the sacrifice on the animal shaving of the head clearly indicates the Umrah was accepted. So it can't be Umrah to Qadha. Yeah? Otherwise there's no need to sacrifice the animal and shave the head. Just go back. What do you think? Just go back. No point. Yeah? That's an indication that Allah has uh, uh, accepted the Umrah at that time as well of, in Hudaybiyah of the messenger and his companions. So, Umrah, nevertheless, at that time, Maymuna, who had lost her husband, Maymuna is a sister of Ummul Fadl. Ummul Fadl is the wife of who? You don't have to remember it. You know, because I've read Sira so many times, I'm just making you think a bit, that's all. But Ummul Fadl is the mother of Abdullah ibn Abbas, and therefore she's the wife of Abbas, right? But unlike Abbas, who embraced Islam, when? Most authentic report? Just before Fatou Makkah, right? At Fatou Makkah, when the Prophet Sallallahu comes, just at that time, yeah? Although he was a supporter of Rasulullah Sallallahu yeah? He wasn't like Abu Lahab. He was more like Abu Talib, 
but didn't die. He embraced Islam finally. But Umm al-Fadl and his uh, children embraced Islam much earlier. Umm al-Fadl was one of the convert, early converts, but she stayed with her husband. And Abdul Abbas stayed as well there. And Abdul Abbas says, we were from the Mustadafin. Because Quran, many makes hijrah obligatory. Yeah? And punishment for those who don't do it, it gave an except, exemption to those who are mustadafin, to live in the place of kufr and enmity. These people had declared war. It wasn't just kufr, like we're staying in a place. These had declared war on the Messenger of Allah in Medina. Yeah? So it's not a. So, we were from the mustadafin. We were the weak ones. Yeah? We didn't have the ability, he meant his family, including his mom, etc., to migrate. But the father didn't want to because he was still mushrik. Okay. So her Umm al Fadl's sister is Maymuna. When the Prophet comes for this Umrah, that's when he marries Maymuna. And Maymuna then travels with him after this Umrah to back to Medina. Okay? So it's in the very last years. I mean, uh, if uh, they be a sixth year, this is seventh year Hijra. All right? Seventh year Hijra. Uh, a year year or so before, of course, Fatul Mecca. So that's, if you look at, therefore, in the Latin years, the Prophet Sallallahu Khadija has passed away, radiallahu anha, and I told who else passed away? From the wives. Okay. Who else passed away from the wives before he left the world? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Khadija, of course. Which other one? One or ones. Told you last time. Which one did he marry and she passed away just a few months after marriage? The one I've underlined. <laughs> Two Zainabs, isn't there? So remember, it's the, the right one. Zainab bint Khuzaymah. Yeah? What was her nickname? Ummul Masakin. Okay? Mother of the, the poor, the miskin, Masakin, because she used to be generous. Interesting, though, for both Zainabs. Some people say that Umm Musakin was the title of Zainab bin Jash. It's not true. It is referring to her clearly. But Zainab bin Jash is interesting. Because she was well known from authentic hadith as one who was very fervent in ibadah. In ibadah first, ritual worship. So much so the Prophet ﷺ had to tell her off at one occasion. Because she prayed in the night and he found on one occasion he found some ropes or cloth on the pillars of the masjid. And he said, Who, what's this for? They said, it's so and so and so, a woman, when she stands up in prayer because she gets so tired, she ties herself so she can stand in the qayyam for longer. He said, they removed them. There's no need for this kind of takleef. Pray, if you feel tired, lie down, sit down, sleep. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, so she was very fervent for that. A bit like you could say Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he's very famous for. And there's various Sahaba who are, were inclined to go too much into. And he, the Prophet pulled them back, didn't, didn't encourage them, pulled them back to moderation. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The other thing about Zainab bin Jas that's famous is the Prophet before he passed away, he said in authentic hadith to his wives, he said, the one with the, the, uh, the longest hand span, okay, the, the longest arm, or the longest reach, if you can put it in the English term, the one with the longest reach will be the first to follow me from the wives. Yeah? From the wives, and the first to follow me. So, a hadith mentioned that uh, Ummahat al they said that 
after the Prophet where passed away, we used to gather together and we used to measure the arm length of each one, see who had the longest arms. We could never come to any conclusion until Zainab bin Jash passed away from us, we realized what he meant. That it was metaphoric to mean the most generous to the poor from amongst us, and it was Zainab bin Jash. Aisha Ummul Mu'minin says that in authentic hadith. So that's you know, what he mentioned, an indication of what Zainab bin Jash was like again. Um, out of all of them, after Khadija passing away, remember I, he married no one when Khadija was around, which is very significant. But out of all of it, it was well known but the Prophet said it as well in authentic hadith. He says, we're ordered to be just, and if you have more than one, just to all of them. But what is the state of the heart we can't control? And it was well known, and it is documented, and all the wives knew that the one he loved most out of all of them, and that was just that state of the heart, was Aisha. And therefore, so that, yeah, especially in later times when she becomes elderly in later life, used to give her days to Aisha. So the Prophet said, you go, go to her. Out of her own willingness, she used to do it. Out of endearment and love and respect for the Messenger of Allah. And all of them agreed in his last illness to allow him to be cared for in the apartment of Aisha. So all of them agreed with that. So that was uh, uh, that's something else that we should uh, know about. What about these two names? Rehana. Rehana is mentioned after the battle, the Ghazwa of Quraiza. Quraiza, Bani Quraiza was the last tribe, remember, of the, the uh, Jews that was left still kept their treaty till till during the battle of khandaq not after the battle of khandaq <laughs> very important during the battle of khandaq they changed sides and they became enemies from within and declared war that is treachery of the highest kind <laughs> and treason of the highest kind and therefore they were given the death penalty the fighters after that it is reported about Zay rehana being one of the captives right there are three reports, all of them are weak, about Rehana. One, she was taken as captive and stayed with Rasulullah as a, as a right hand possess, as a slave. Two, she was given the freedom and she turned, returned back to the people, her family. It will be in Khaybar at that time, right? Two, weak report again. Third, she was given the freedom and she chose to marry Rasulullah as his wife. All three reports are weak, so we don't really know, all right? Any of these possible. Some report it as sure, but we can't even say for sure whether she was a slave girl or even a wife of Rasulullah, so we don't know. So question mark remains in regards to that, okay? That's the best analysis of the situation with Rehana. And therefore some Shia writers don't even mention it. Yeah? But we should mention it to realise what the re where the, the truth lies or try and figure it out. But it's not possible. Maria Qibdiya was in the year of the Prophet sending out messages like to Heraclius and remember one to Macaucus who the Patriarch of uh, Alexandria or Egypt we're talking about, yes? And he received the letter in a nice way, unlike the, per the Persian. And of course, Heraclius was also respectful nevertheless. We went into great detail with that one. But he decided to send some gifts to the Messenger of Allah. Yeah. And the emissary who came on behalf of the Messenger of Allah to uh, Egypt was Hatib ibn Abi Balta. Hatib ibn Abi Balta. What is he famous for in the story, in the seerah? 
Wakey, wakey, boys and girls. <laughs> Hatib ibn Abi Balfa'a. He was the one before Fatu Mecca, which we covered very recently, who decided to send a message to his family or to the Quraysh, yeah, to betray, betray in inverted commas, because the Prophet forgave him. He was the one who sent it with a woman to go and tell them that the message is coming to attack Mecca. But she was stopped on the way. That's how it would make you all when Omar wanted to kill him. Prophet was saying, he's Badri. How do you know Omar that Allah has said for the people who stood at Badr, do whatever you will from now on, everything's forgiven. SubhanAllah. <laughs> anyway, so it seemed the Makokas sent, um, which is mentioned in authentic reports, he sent gifts and he sent Duldul. The, the, the mule, the white mule to the Prophet Sallallahu who he was riding in the, the Ghazwa that we've just covered with Hunayn, the Hawazin, yes, Duldul, the white mule. And he sent Maria, was mentioned as a slave girl, to the Prophet Sallallahu with a gift, and her sister Sirene. Sirene was married off to Hassan ibn Thabit, Hassan ibn Thabit, uh, who was believer and the poet of Rasulullah Hassan ibn Thabit didn't stay married to her long Sireen, because after these gifts come Ghazwatul Mu'ta comes very soon a few months within and he's martyred there with Jafar yeah? Hassan ibn Thabit and Zaid all of them martyred there when Khalid ibn Walid takes charge yes, Hassan ibn Thabit is one of them and Maria was with the Prophet Ulama differ on this. Some say she was married because they try and use the fact that she was from noble background, etc., etc. Some say that out of apol being apologetic, by the way, I have to say that. Because they don't like the idea of saying that the Prophet Sallallahu at a time which he was allowed, had a slave girl. And, I'm, and for that, I've mentioned to you before that Islam changed if the whole concept of slavery. Made them like family and brothers and sisters wasn't like the image we have of American blacks being treated in America. Absolutely nothing like it. And it wasn't even based on race. It wasn't based on race, number one. Yeah. And the Prophet Islam and Islam completely changed the, the, the whole concept. And so much so that people wanted to stay a slave to the family rather than be released and go somewhere else. I'm thinking, where shall I go now? I'd rather stay with you. Yeah. That's the sort of thing. Although the encouragement for freeing became more and more avid as with <laughs> Islam. Yeah? Done something wrong? Free a slave. Kafara for this? Free a slave. Yeah? Regularly for this kind of thing. One of the things, free a slave as, as, uh, as, as charity. Anyway, there's a difference of opinion on, on that. But the strongest opinion most likely is that she was a slave girl of Rasulullah Sallallahu and, and, and the ulama who would say that, say she was never known as Ummahat al Mu'mini, she was known as Umm Walad, mother of the child, because she's the only one who had the child to Rasulullah, aside from Khadija, name of Ibrahim, which I've already mentioned to you that he died a year or 18 months or so after uh, 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 years of age. <coughs> um, again, his death, I mentioned to you before, the, the sign of the truthfulness of Rasulullah the day of his death was a solar eclipse and the Prophet prayed an eclipse prayer and everybody's saying around perfect opportunity isn't it that oh it's an eclipse because Ibrahim his sons died they came to the ear of the message of Allah he said the sun and the moon are the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they have no connection or link with somebody <coughs> being born or dying here he could have said the other way around couldn't he didn't. It's nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, okay. Last thing, although we don't have much time, but I don't, therefore I don't want to spend so much time on it. But if you go to Surah Tahrim, and I have to cover this, what happened in this juncture was a separation of Rasulullah from all his wives. 
Surah Tahrim at the beginning, the ayat, and if I start reciting and going into them, we'll run out of time. We'll be back with this again next time. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So I want to summarize it for you. Surah Tahrim deals with the Prophet ﷺ first being told by Allah, why do you make something haram which Allah has made halal? Ulama and ahadith differ as to what this was. This is all linked with the story of him separating as well. Then it goes on about a secret which the Prophet ﷺ told one of his wives, right, and told her not to tell anybody else. And she told a second. Okay, this is Surah Tahrim. And then it goes on warning those two wives, yeah, and then it generalizes about, uh, about basically hurting the Messenger of Allah. Okay? And yeah, so it especially talking to those two uh, about uh, not keeping the trust of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, and if they persist in that kind of behavior, being uh, fronting to him, and it generalizes to the other wives as well. Asa Rabbuhu in Talaka Kunna and Yubdilahu as Wajan Khairam Min Kunna, Muslimatin, Mu'minatin, Qanitatin. Yeah, perhaps your Lord, if he were to divorce you, that became that serious. These are quite tough verses. Well, if he divorces you, your Lord might grant him in exchange wives better than you. Those who truly submit to Allah are full of faith, obedient, disposed to repentance, and given to worship and fasting. Both from uh, those who were previously wedded and from virgins. So, that was a warning given. And before that, Allah SWT even says to them, In tatuba ilallah, that's talking to the two wives. If you two turned for repentance to Allah, فَقَدْ صَغَتْ قُلُوبُكُمَا For the hearts of both of you have swerved from the straight path. Oh, very serious, isn't it? وَإِن تَظَاهَرَ عَلَيْهِ However, if you support one another against him, the Messenger of Allah, right? What does Allah say? Allah says, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ مَوْلَاهُ وَجِبْرِيلُ وَصَالِهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمَلَائِكُتُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ ظَهِيرُ Then surely Allah is his supporter and protector with Gabriel and the righteous believers and the angels all supporting. Those are pretty tough words, isn't it? Okay, so the ahadith, Allah SWT kept the, the names of who the two were secret in the Qur'an. But in authentic ahadith, Abdullah ibn Abbas, for example, um, asks Umar, who are these two? So Umar says it was my daughter Hafsa and the daughter of Abu Bakr, Aisha radiallahu anhuma. It was them two he's talking about. Um, but what happens, and the verse shows you that all the wives got involved. Because the Prophet didn't separate only from Hafsa and Aisha radiallahu anhuma, but from all of them which is the hadith of Umar clarifying that authentic hadith reported in Bukhari, Muslim and others as well. Okay. Now, about the beginning of the uh, uh, surah, about making something haram which Allah made halal, the most authentic report is again to do with the wives and about jealousy. That the Prophet Sallallahu Aisha reports this, went to Zainab bin Jass's place and he stayed longer than he normally does. Why? Because she'd brought some honey and he, ate, he liked it, he ate it. So Aisha said, I plotted with, because she got jealous, I plotted with uh, Hafsa and with Soda that when he comes back, say that your breath smells of maghafir. And maghafir was like a plant which had a foul sort of smell. And if the... Um, if, for, if the bees had sat on that kind of plant, etc., then that would come out in the honey. But it was, she was making it up. It didn't smell foul. They just wanted to say that. So that he wouldn't go there again, just to cause, cause some problem. This is an authentic hadith. So the Prophet says, when he came, that's what they did. And he said, oh, that's it. I'm not going to eat that honey from now on. 
right? That's why Allah said, why you... When the Prophet says, I'm not going to eat it, it's like others were going to think it's haram or something. That's why Allah said, why are you making haram that which is halal? And he was to do a kafara. The second verse t says that. Because eh? it becomes like an oath for the Messenger of Allah. Abdullah Abbas says, when he says that, it's like an oath he had to break it by doing a kafara. Paying some sort of ransom. To release himself from that. But the other report also for this mentions that it was to do with uh, being at the place of Hafsa and it was her. So there's some confusion even in the authentic reports in Bukhari that it was Hafsa he, place he was at and he had the honey there. And Aisha I, I became jealous and had others together. So we're still not very clear actually as to who it was and perhaps there's a wisdom in that we weren't supposed to know anyway <laughs> that's how I leave it because the authentic reports are uh, that mixing with each other another report mentions that it was Hafsa and it wasn't to do with the honey but the Prophet Sallallahu was found he, he used the apartment of Hafsa and the bed to have his uh, intimate relationship with Maria right that's another report the majority of those reports are weak but when I was going through it with Shaykh Abdul, we found an authentic report that indicating that as well, that it's possible. Yeah. And Hafsa got jealous and said, well, not only that, you, you use, you, she got jealous and she objected, etc. And the Prophet Sassam noticed her uh, upsetness and said, look, I won't go with her anymore. I won't have my relationship with her anymore. And that's why the verse came that why do you make halal that which, uh, uh, haram that which is halal? So that's another report. So it could be to do with that, could be to do with the honey. Allahu alam. Ibn Kathir actually gives all, he does the best uh, analysis of this. And you know what he says at the end after giving all the reports, he says, Allahu alam. <laughs> Allah knows best what was, where the truth really is. But what we know about the truth is Omar's report, which he says about this uh, talaq, because he actually says that, Omar. He says in a long report, he says, when we were in Mecca, we were the dominant ones. And I mentioned this to you before, this is from Omar. When we came to Medina, the women were the dominant ones over us. Now the Prophet didn't criticize that and treat it as a negative. This is cultural change. But Omar has a problem with it. Omar definitely has a problem with it. And our women learned from them, meaning the Muhajir women from Mecca learned from them, including his daughter and his wife. So one day I was telling off my wife, he says, Omar. And she started answering me back, giving me lip. Yeah. For him, Omar, he doesn't take that kind of... Especially in that time of his life. Omar isn't the same, by the way, after Rasulullah leaves the world. Omar's been moulded by the Messenger of Allah. And you see him later with his family and wife. He's not the same Omar. Yeah. But at this juncture, he is. How dare you? And she says, well, why not? Yeah, Why not? The wives, including your daughter, of the Messenger, they answer back to him. And that's him. You're not even the same as him. <laughs> it feels so belittle. He said, do they? What? My daughter as well? So he said, I grabbed my thing. Yeah. You know, and he describes it as though he's barely put his cloak on and he's dashing straight out to the house of Hafsa. So he says, so I heard, do you want back? She says, yes. Yes, we do. So he says, you must be careful. Do you realize that when you're hurting him, that he's a messenger of God? Yeah. He must, so he warns her and everything. Then he goes, decides to go to Um Salama's apartment as well. Now Um Salama is not his daughter. So this is famous about Um Salama. And he says the same to her. I heard that you've been answering back and the wives answer back. She says, what's it to do with you, Omar? Omar, you seem to stick your nose in everywhere, including between the wives of the Prophet. Yeah? Meaning, keep it out. So he felt. <laughs> he's saying it in Hadith, he said, he said, oh, she put me in my place, so I left quietly. <laughs> I didn't respond anything to what she said. So I'm sorry, I tells him straight. However, he says, running out of time, he says, later on it transpires that one night, he said, I was in, my, uh, my neighbor was so-and-so. We used to alternate our time with the Messenger of Allah because we were busy doing trade. This is well known for the companions who weren't from Ashabu Sufa, by the way, I mentioned to you. That they used to go to lessons of the Messenger of Allah. So Omar said when he went to the lessons, he used to come back and tell me everything, what he'd learned. 
And when I went on rotation, when he wasn't there, I used to come and tell him everything. So that's how they used to learn from each other, from the Messenger of Allah as well, where they were busy working. He said, one day, this neighbor who used to do that, rotate with me, bashed on my door in the middle of the night after Isha. So he said, I said to him, coming down, what's the matter? Have the Ghassans attacked us or something? So that indication in the Hadith indicates to ulama who say it was around this time because Mu'ta had already taken place and there was trouble with the people on the borders towards Sham where the Romans were. And Tabuk is going to come because of that. So he said that, they say that indication shows you, puts it in its place where it was when this incident happened. He said, no, 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 no. Mes it's, it's worse than that. The messenger of Allah has divorced his wives. So he goes, oh my goodness, Omar, you know, what is he thinking? Why is he thinking about his daughter? Yeah, so he puts on his cloak and, no, 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 he doesn't do that. He waits till Fajr for this. And after Fajr, he goes to visit his daughter and he finds her crying. And he says, has he divorced you? And she goes, I don't know. He says, didn't I tell you not to carry on like this with this kind of behavior? Yeah, that he will do, if he divorces you, Allah will find other, others better. <laughs> right, anyway. Uh, in one authentic report, actually, we have that the Prophet has some divorced, in, not in this one, divorced Hafsa. We have one authentic report, he divorced Hafsa. And Jibreel comes to him and says, take her back. Allah said, take her back. She's your wife in paradise. They're all your wives in paradise, actually. Subhanallah. That's the status of the wives of the Prophet. They are all your wives in paradise. Anyway, so at this juncture, Omar then goes to the mosque and finds that the Prophet is in an attic room. We don't know where this is, near the apartments, but it's an attic place. It's an upstairs place. He has to go up the steps. He tries to get entrance. Prophet comes, prays, goes back up. Prophet also had a fall off a horse, so he was injured at this time as well. But he spent one month in this attic away from his wives. So, eventually he gets permission to go in. And this is the famous hadith which mentions about the Prophet lying on a straw mat. I haven't got time to go into all that. And he asks the Messenger of Allah, have you divorced your wives? The Messenger of Allah says, no. So he's so happy. So he comes down, announces it, he's shouting in the masjid. He hasn't divorced his wives yet, because the Sahaba think that he's divorced them. So that news spreads everywhere. Soon after that, the Messenger of Allah actually leaves, the month is up, leaves the place and comes back. And the Quran in Surah Al-Ahzab, which we haven't got time to go into, mentions the verse which the Prophet has is given as uh, to mention to the, each wife of the Prophet Sallallahu a choice. Quickly find it before we finish. Ah, oh, yes. Verse 28 in Surah number 33. O Prophet, tell your wives. If they, if they wish for the life of this world and its beautification, then come. Yeah? Uh, I will uh, uh, release you in an honorable way. Uh, yeah. Then come and I will make some provisions for you. Mean I'll provide those things and I'll release you in an honorable way. But, وَإِن كُنْتَنْ تُرِدْنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهَ وَالدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَدَّ لِلْمُخْسِنَاتِ مِنْ كُنَّ أَجْرًا عَظِيمًا But if you seek Allah and His Messenger and the board of the hereafter, then surely Allah has prepared a great reward for those who, of you who do good. This is the offer made to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, each one, one at a time. That indicates also that there was trouble to do with the embellishments of the, the world. Why ulama said, Lots of booty coming in, other <coughs> Sahaba and Sahabiyat are getting richer, but they're living a very poor life. Okay, that was part of the trouble, why they were annoying the Messenger of Allah. And annoying the Messenger of Allah is a serious sin, even from the wives. Okay, so uh, to finish with, he first comes to Ummul Mu'minin Aisha anha saying this. But before he says it, he says, Aisha, I'm going to make you an offer. Perhaps before you answer, you want to take some advice from your parents, because he's young. He says, Ya Rasulullah, and then he makes the offer. 
Says, Ya Rasulullah, no, I don't need to go and ask mom and dad. <laughs> don't need to go and ask my parents. I can answer you now. Yeah? That I want Allah and His Messenger. Yeah? And she says, don't tell anybody else of the otherwise what I said. And Prophet Sallallahu she's trying it on to see if they slip up, but she doesn't. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, why? If they ask me, I'll tell them exactly what you said, Aisha. <laughs> she tells them again. So all of them agree, same way as Aisha, uh, Ummahat al Mu'mineen, they remain the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also, at this juncture, is stopped from marrying anybody else. And they are forbidden from marrying anybody else after him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that was a story to do with that. We'll carry on next time with Inshallah. Ghazwat al Tabuk. I'm sorry I had to hurry at the end, otherwise it will be long. Some details may be missing from it.